If you enjoyed our episode on the Heaven's Gate cult, you've got to check out Stitcher's new 10-part investigation into the Heaven's Gate story. You'll hear real accounts from people who lost loved ones to this deadly cult. You can hear episodes of the Heaven's Gate podcast in your favorite podcast app right now. So go subscribe in Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And this is Cults. Today we're going to be taking a deeper look at the most disturbing New Age group in Australia's history, the Great White Brotherhood of Initiates and Masters, also known as The Family. I'm here with my co-host, Vanessa Richardson. Hi, everyone. In part one of our two-part series on the Great White Brotherhood, we focused on the cult's leader, Anne Hamilton Byrne, revealing how childhood abandonment drove her to form the Brotherhood in an attempt to build a family of her own. In today's episode, we'll learn more about the Great White Brotherhood itself. Who were the men and women who composed Anne's power structure of professionals? Who were the 28 children she used that power to collect? And what treatment did they endure as conscripted members of her cult? Stay tuned to find out. Due to the graphic nature of this material, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of child abuse and drug use that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. The Great White Brotherhood of Initiates and Masters operated with full force for 30 years, from 1963 to 1993. Based in Australia, its members believed that their leader, Anne Hamilton Byrne, was Jesus Christ reincarnate, collecting children so she could rebuild humanity after a coming nuclear apocalypse. Though the cultists regularly dosed with LSD during their rituals and ceremonies, they weren't hippies. They were upper-middle-class professionals who had gone in search of a spiritual awakening when faced with the possibility of nuclear annihilation. The year is 1963. With an ever-lengthening line of spiritualists at her back and the respected academic Dr. Raynor Johnson on her leash, Anne was ready to start building the organization that would come to be known as The Family. Since she was supposed to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, Anne anointed most of her loyal supporters as reincarnations of Christ's apostles. The first of these was Raynor, whom she named John the Baptist because he made membership expansion possible beyond the people who attended her yoga classes. After a career in science and academia, his list of contacts was impressive. Throughout the 1960s, he would refer his patients to Anne and insist that colleagues meet with her for spiritual guidance. And these people were educated professionals from the judicial, medical, political, and academic fields? That's right. There were lawyers who could defend the family in court or forge passports and birth certificates. There were doctors and nurses who could give access to aged people who never spent their wealth and manipulate the elderly into including her in their last will and testament. There were even judges who could criminally sentence anyone threatening the family. To give you an idea of the scope of Rayner's influence, one of his friends was Ambrose Pratt, a journalist, author, and businessman who helped form the modern Liberal Party in Australia. Another was Sir Reginald Ansett, a knighted businessman who would eventually own an Australian airline and a television channel. Raynor had powerful friends, an invaluable asset. However, another one of Anne's followers may have become more important than him at this early stage, psychiatrist Howard Whitaker. Without him, Anne may have found it difficult to convert and control the rest. Dr. Whitaker was a researcher who used psychedelic drugs to treat mental illnesses, specifically LSD, a drug he would secretly funnel into the family's storehouses for decades. Since many of our listeners may not have indulged in LSD themselves, could you describe the effects brought on by the drug? Not from first-hand experience, but I have done extensive research. Lysergic acid diethylamide, commonly referred to by the abbreviation LSD, or simply acid, is one of the most potent hallucinogenic drugs around. It's typically swallowed or held under the tongue, but for the most intense effect, it can be injected. Whatever method of ingestion a person uses, it sends them on a hallucinogenic trip, which can last for several hours. During this period, they may experience intense hallucinations and heightened sensory perception. A lot of experiments with the drug were carried out during the 60s, some finding immense positive benefits. Actor Cary Grant claimed acid therapy helped him get over his hang-ups about his mother and live a less neurotic life. 
However, since the United States government outlawed LSD in 1967, there is still a lot we don't know about its effects. Even though it was outlawed in the States, LSD was available to Anne because it was legal in Australia until the mid-70s, if only available to medical professionals. Hmm, that's interesting. Anne claimed the drug had spiritual benefits. She made all of her new followers endure a ceremonial ritual called a clearing. Anne would have one of her loyal followers lead an initiate into a closed room with no windows and shoot them up with LSD. You said that was the most potent method, right? That's right. Once they'd been dosed, the lights would be turned off and they'd be left alone. After the initiate had stewed in their own thoughts for a while, the door would burst open and there would be Anne. In a flowing white gown, a bucket of dry ice behind her, billowing smoky white clouds beneath her feet. I know it sounds like Scooby-Doo theatrics, but under the influence of LSD, it was a mind-blowing experience. She'd then enter the room and convince them they were seeing the almighty Jesus Christ. They were so high that they'd believe it. I'm sure that's not what researchers had in mind when they discussed the drug's positive effects. It's criminal to dose someone with a drug for your own benefit, but not an unusual tactic for a cult leader. If you're a consistent listener of cults, you'll remember from our first episode that Charles Manson used LSD to manipulate his followers. Under the influence of the drug, they were far more susceptible to his doomsday prophecies. It wasn't only Anne's followers who took LSD, but also Anne herself. She was a huge proponent of the drug and dosed regularly. Keeping that in mind, let me ask you this. Last week we discussed Anne's mother's schizophrenia. Does the disease run in families? And, and even if Anne was schizophrenic, would that explain her behavior? Well, like many questions of the mind, that's a difficult one to answer. There is no specific gene that scientists have associated with schizophrenia. That means there isn't a blood test you can take that will make it any clearer that you're going to pass the disease on to your children. However, studies suggest that a combination of genes may be responsible for causing the disorder. What we do know is that a person is 11 times more likely to develop schizophrenia if they have a relative who has the disease. If that relative is the person's mother, there is a 12% chance of inheriting the disease. So Anne could potentially have inherited her mother's schizophrenia. If that was the case, how would her habitual LSD use have affected her? Well, drugs like LSD can magnify or intensify the symptoms of someone with a genetic vulnerability. And some of the effects of LSD, such as visual and auditory hallucinations, synesthesia, and altered sense of time, are eerily similar to schizophrenic symptoms. If Anne was under the influence of LSD during her schizophrenic episodes, the drug could have bolstered her delusions, leading her to believe that she was Christ but it's difficult to conclusively say that Anne had schizophrenia. To answer that question, we have to figure out if Anne really believed the things she told her followers. Did she really believe she was Jesus Christ? Unfortunately, Anne's the only one who knows the answer to those questions, and she's such a prolific liar that we'll never be able to know for sure. Mm, of course. And once she had adults under her sway, thanks in part to the LSD, she was able to move them onto her greater goal, obtaining children. Time for a quick change of subject. When you cook and eat delicious and healthy meals with HelloFresh, you'll want to keep doing it. With HelloFresh, all the ingredients are delivered right to your door in recyclable, insulated packaging and come pre-measured in handy labeled meal kits so you know which ingredients go with which recipe. And HelloFresh offers a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly, including the classic plan, which comes with a wide variety of meat, fish, and seasonal produce, the veggie plan, vegetarian recipes with plant-based proteins, and the family plan, quick and easy meals the whole family will love. Better yet, you can choose a delivery day that works best for your busy schedule and even pause your account for weeks at a time. You won't spend all night in the kitchen because recipes only take around 30 minutes. There are lots of one-pot recipes for seriously speedy cooking and minimal cleanup. And each week, there's a 20-minute meal on the classic menu from when you really don't have more time than that. The chicken orzo meal I made with cheesy roasted zucchini and tomatoes was not only delicious, but it was so easy to make. And we have a special offer for our listeners for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. Visit HelloFresh.com and enter CULTS30. 
Speaking of fresh, new, and exciting, everyone here at Parcast is so excited for Halloween. Yes, we are. We even have a haunted Halloween podcast. Tell them about your new show, Greg. Okay. Get in the spooky spirit of the season and check out haunted places. Every episode, I take you on a spooky audio tour of a new haunted place and its haunted history. Every haunted place on earth has a terrifying, real backstory. I tell the tales of the supernatural that turn these previously normal places into resting grounds for lingering spirits and paranormal activity. Ooh, sounds like a scary bedtime story. Oh, it is. <laughs> so, for all of you horror fans and and to those curious about the paranormal, check out my new show, Haunted Places. It's a podcast podcast. That's the same production company that makes cults, and I'm the host. So you can find Haunted Places wherever you're listening to cults. Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, or Parcast.com. Hmm, now back to the story. By 1968, Anne Hamilton Byrne had gathered all the professionals she would need to accomplish her true goal of building a family with perfect children. How did she go about it? Well, it was estimated that a quarter of the family's members were nurses and doctors and other medical professionals. She'd use them to steal newborns from the arms of their mothers. Sarah Moore was the first child Anne stole. As soon as Sarah was born, a doctor placed a pillow over her mother's head. Ms. Moore's muffled screams were soon put to rest when a nurse injected her with major tranquilizers. Sarah never knew Anne wasn't her real mother until her late teenage years. Sarah's mother wasn't even allowed to look at her. Why didn't Sarah's father rescue her? Sarah's biological father wasn't in the picture. You see, Anne was devious. She chose the weakest targets she could find, single mothers without anyone to protect them. Sarah's mother was only 16 years old and with no husband in sight. She had been disowned by her family. Her doctor was one of Raynor Johnson's daughters, a cult member. But children can't just be stolen. They're not car radios. They're, there are safeguards. There's documentation. And that's why Anne had lawyers under her spell. People who would forge false papers, making Anne the legal guardian of her stolen children. As her family grew, a common ploy was to make up papers which said the new additions were twins or triplets of children already taken by the cult. She stole 28 children this way? Well, she had many different methods of getting them. Some of her followers were social workers who would allow Anne to bypass normal channels to build up her family. Sometimes children were given to her by members of the sect. Mothers gave away their babies? Well, not without proper persuasion. Anne was known to perform miracles in exchange for children. What this really meant was that she'd have her corrupt doctors select a patient who had a very young child and inflict an illness on that unsuspecting mother by poisoning them. When the mother was bedridden and weak, Anne would come to them and offer to cure them in exchange for absolute service. Once they agreed, she'd have her doctors stop poisoning the mother and bam, the woman would make a miraculous recovery. Mm. Anne kept the children at her home for three years until 1971, when she moved her first seven children from her home in the hills to a lake house in Eildon, where the rest of our story takes place. She called the house Uptop, or Kai Lama, a reference to the Buddhism which she had built her cult upon. The first seven children were all around age three when they arrived at Uptop, and, unlike the rest of the children, would take Anne's surname. Because of this, they all believed they were brothers and sisters. Sarah Moore was the oldest of these children and would go on to play an important role in the cult's fate as she came of age. But when Sarah was a child, Uptop served as the primary hub for cult activities. But at more than 500 members, the cult couldn't reside in one lake house alone. Uptop lay hidden in a wooded area, set aside from the usual suburbs for well-to-do families who wanted lakeside property. That's where the kids lived. Anne lived mainly in the Dandenong Ranges, hills about a mile away, and home to most of the adult members. Since the majority of the family's members were very wealthy, they used their money to buy a property in the Dandenong suburb of Fernie Creek while maintaining their professional careers. They wanted to be near Anne, and she certainly wanted them close to her. She kept them on a short leash, not only for control, but because she was paranoid. Sources inside the cult say she wanted her followers close for protection in case the unbelievers tried to kill her. The result was a community composed of almost entirely cultists. Of course, they didn't think of themselves as cultists. 
Fran Parker, an early member, described the followers as just lovely people who seemed to be looking for a spiritual dimension in their lives. That's the testimonial these people gave for their involvement in this community. But what did they think was the purpose for their leader to have nearly 30 children? Well, it comes back to what we discussed in last week's episode, apocalypse. If you recall, these people were afraid of mutually assured destruction after the advent of nuclear weapons and felt like the world could end at any moment. By this time, the Cuban Missile Crisis had also happened, and tensions were even higher than they were in the previous years. Anne's sermons promised a kind of rebirth if the apocalypse were ever to come, which, according to her, it certainly would in the mid-'80s. She explained that once the rest of the world had been destroyed, up top would remain. These children she had chosen to save, as well as her adult followers who remain loyal, would survive to rebuild society. As one up top child put it, they were each given the responsibility of being perfect children who would save the world. Anne wanted everyone to know she had perfect children. Here we see the racist origin of the Great White Brotherhood's name. The group would ensure her children became the white master race after the rest of humanity's obliteration. She modeled them after the Von Trapp family from the popular musical The Sound of Music. Each of them had bleach blonde hair and similar bowl cuts. She'd often have them dressed in identical, high quality, and old fashioned outfits pink frilled dresses and stockings for the girls, blue turtlenecks, slacks, and loafers for the boys. This was especially true when she had them pose for photos, which would be seen by the outside world. That sounds like a case of hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Another show of Anne's fiendish intellect. Rather than attempt to hide her children from the public eye, Anne used them as a kind of marketing campaign for the family. The media she put out, photos and videos, portrayed the children as extremely well-mannered with the best of everything. Nice clothes, a beautiful house, even coordinated musical routines. The image she put out to Australia was that the family fostered an idyllic lifestyle that anyone would be lucky to be a part of. In 1974, an official school was set up at Uptop to give further credence to this idea. But things were not as they appeared to the outside world. By the time Anne had acquired her perfect children, her interest in being a mother had all but disappeared. The Uptop children were more of a fetishistic collection than an actual family. Despite this, the children believed well into their teens that Anne was their biological mother, and they craved her affection. However, like the parents who abandoned Anne, she was seldom present to care for them. Do you think Anne's abandonment influenced her distance from her own children? Well, that's an interesting question. We often see one side of childhood abandonment, that of the children or the parent who was left to care for them. However, when we look at it from the perspective of the abandoners, we see that they're not always the malicious figures society paints them as. It's a well-deserved reputation. Well, maybe, but it doesn't go very far towards understanding these people's motives. Many absentee parents report leaving their children based upon a sense of inadequacy or shame. They believe their children and partner are too good for them and that they're ruining their lives with alcohol abuse or an inability to maintain a steady job. Anne may have been disgusted with her constant drug use and decadent lifestyle and felt like she shouldn't have been near her children. Would we see that kind of humility from a woman who claimed to be Jesus Christ? Well, we might not, but maybe she felt that way inside. We don't know. Another explanation is that it was one of those times when you get what you've always fantasized about, and it turns out that it isn't that great. Anne had spent so much time idealizing what having her own children would be like. When she finally got them, she might have suddenly realized that raising children is immensely difficult and not what she had made it out to be. Hmm, that's interesting. Who took care of the children while Anne was away? Well, Anne left the children's care to a group of female caregivers selected from within the cult, referred to as aunties. These lieutenants were feared by the children for the extremely strict code of discipline they imposed upon them. There were three aunties who oversaw things at Uptop. Elizabeth Whitaker was a comely, black-haired woman, ex-wife to one of the first psychologists who joined the cult. Trish McFarlane was a woman with a thick Australian accent, her voice raspy because of her smoking addiction. Finally, there was Margot McClellan, one of Anne's yoga students. She was the least senior of the aunties and had to sleep on a stair landing and keep her belongings in her car because the house had become too crowded with stolen children. The aunties kept the up-top children on a strict regimen, day and night. At 5.30 every morning, they'd have to wake up and make their beds. 
Then they'd have an hour of yoga meditation. They were taught to connect with the ethereal plane or some other spiritual nonsense which was unattainable. From there, they would be sent to a room made up for school lessons. If there was any delay in any part of this ritual or any minor transgression, the children would be punished. Was it the British style of corporal punishment? The aunties beat them with the cane? I'm afraid it was much worse. Beatings were commonplace, but there were many more sinister tortures. Once a cult member who came to teach the children in art class found that his brushes were missing when he went home. He notified the aunties and they rounded up the children for one of the usual punishments. They filled up a bucket of water and one by one held each child's head beneath the water, asking them if they took the brushes between dunks. The torture continued for hours. Sarah Moore remembers it well, being drowned to the limit of possibility without losing consciousness. None of the kids confessed. Later, the brushes were found in the grass outside of the house. The teacher had dropped them getting into his car. Not only was Anne aware of her lieutenant's brutality, she encouraged the behavior. Later in life, Margot discussed her involvement in the punishments. She said that the strictness of the discipline was as much for the aunties as it was for the children. Anne told her that the spiritual path was a tough one. She would sometimes have to do things she found unpleasant. Anne not only required this torture, she seemed to take pleasure in it as well. When she was away from Uptop, she required reports on the children's behavior. If they had been bad, she would have an auntie hold the phone up to the child's face so she could hear their screams while another auntie belted them. Do you buy Margaret's excuse that she didn't want to hurt the children? It sounds like the classic excuse employed by the Nazis at Nuremberg. They were just following orders. Mm, well, Greg, the same year as the Nuremberg trials, a Yale University psychologist named Stanley Milgram conducted a study to determine how receiving orders affected a person's capacity for committing heinous acts. In the 1963 study, which would come to be known as the Milgram Experiment, psychologists brought in a subject who they called the teacher and asked them to press a button which, they were told, would shock an unseen learner. The teacher was told to shock the learner every time they answered one of a series of word association questions wrong. The shock started at 15 volts and increased with each wrong answer up to a lethal amount of 450 volts. That sounds like a dangerous study. That's what the teachers thought. But what they didn't know was that the learners were in on it with the psychologists. They'd get the questions wrong on purpose to see how far the teachers would go under orders to continue. Despite being able to hear screams of pain and desperate pleas about having a heart condition from the adjoining room, 65% of the teachers continued to the end and administered the supposed lethal shock. That's disturbing. But, but what does that say, though, about Anne's sway over the aunties? Do you think it means that the aunties are less culpable? Researchers found that acting on orders made people think they weren't responsible for their actions. They found participants were slow to connect their pushing of the button with delivery of the shocks. When they were being ordered, teachers felt passive, like they were a mere observer of the actions of the people conducting the study. But I don't think this psychological disconnect makes the aunties any less guilty. Though they may have felt the torture was happening because of Anne, they were the ones committing the abuse. There is no excuse. While the aunties were busy managing the children, Anne's other followers had started construction. In the mid-1970s, the cult built themselves a brown brick temple in the Dandenong Ranges, across the road from Rainer Johnson's house. They called it the Shantinekitan Lodge, named after an ashram in Tagore, India. Another of Anne's references to Hinduism, Shantinekitan means abode of peace. Behind its padlocked gates, members would commune on Sundays and Thursdays for days of worship. Anne would preach her doomsday prophecies and pseudo-spiritual sermons for hours to eager followers, made more receptive by doses of LSD. If she was away, they'd listen to a recording. And this was business as usual during the years the cult spent at Fernie Creek. Cultists split their time between their jobs, Anne's teachings, and doing the dirty work required to collect the children who would repopulate the earth. The abuse inflicted upon these children wasn't only physical. The rest of the cultists expanded their minds with psychedelic drugs and, in even more horrific abuse, the children were forced to as well. When Leanne Kreese turned 14, she underwent the initiation ceremony called Going Through, which all the children would have to endure once they came of age. 
She was shot up with LSD and locked in a room where she was kept dosed for days. Every 12 hours, an auntie would enter to administer more of the drug. During her initiation, Leanne screamed so loudly that the neighbors across the lake heard her and called the police. Unfortunately, Anne was prepared. Margot welcomed the officers in and served them tea, distracting them while Trish and Elizabeth stuffed the children into a small crawl space set in a wall in the basement boiler room. The children called it the hole. Once the children were crammed inside, they put a plywood cover over the hole and then a painting on top of that. The children were kept way down in the hole until the officers left. The children were too afraid to scream for help. The things they were taught at Anne's school weren't exactly common core. Among the falsehoods they learned was that the police were evil totalitarian thugs who were always on the lookout for small children. They thought that they were being hidden for their own good and that if the police found them, they would be beaten and raped. On a few occasions, the police found the kids, but Anne had prepared for that too. The children were made to memorize carefully rehearsed scripts, claiming that nothing was wrong if they weren't able to hide quickly enough. In some cases, they were simply unable to tell the police about their abuse because they had no frame of reference to know they were being abused. What do you mean? Well, for example, when one girl was asked if she was being fed properly, she answered yes, because she didn't know how much food a child is supposed to have. She had never known anything else. Starvation was another element of the children's abuse. The kitchen cupboards were padlocked. There was a padlocked chain around the fridge, and an auntie stood guard in the kitchen. The children were allowed to eat very little, usually two or three slices of fruit per meal or a cup of steamed vegetables. Food was used as leverage by the aunties, and children were regularly weighed. If Anne decided they were too heavy, food would be withheld from them. Children often made themselves vomit before the weigh-ins to get their weight down. Beyond the obvious torment of starvation, it couldn't have been psychologically healthy for these children to be weighed constantly. This type of treatment sounds like a breeding ground for body dysmorphic disorder. Can you explain to us what body dysmorphic disorder is? Absolutely. Well, many of us have a certain physical feature we think could be more attractive. He wishes his arms weren't so skinny. She wants to be taller. But we usually only think about these things if a certain experience calls attention to them. However, those with BDD are obsessed with their physical appearance and can think about it every hour of every day. They can't control these negative thoughts about themselves and don't believe it when friends tell them they look fine. That does sound like the up-top children, especially the girls. In fact, Anne was preoccupied with teaching the girls that natural changes occurring to their bodies during puberty were nasty and vile. Sarah reports that, quote, there was this underlying feeling or theme that the girls were dirty and sexual. It made us feel yucky and bad and evil for no reason, unquote. That seems to be a carryover from Anne's own sense of modesty. She was very careful never to let anyone see her in a state of undress, and she transmitted this phobia onto the girls. She had an obsession with being chaste, which can be seen in her desire to have children but never birth them herself. As a result, the girls coming into adolescence in her family didn't know how their bodies functioned. Sarah recalls feeling like she could never be the perfect child unless she was very thin. She equated the two. Do you think Anne's numerous plastic surgeries had anything to do with her children developing the disorder? Mm -hmm. I see what you're getting at. Since Anne was a role model for these children, a mother fixated on improving her physical appearance will foster that same fixation in her children. However, this type of thing is minor next to the constant deprivation of food and accompanying rhetoric telling the children they must remain thin. Children are very impressionable. Mean schoolgirls who tell someone they're too fat can cause BDD. Certainly a child's own mother telling her the future of the human race depends upon her waistline can too. It sounds hyperbolic, but this is what Anne was guilty of. Depraved. Despite her hang-ups about her body image, Sarah resisted. She was very brave and also a bit of a rebel. To keep herself from starving, she found a way into the auntie's room at night, where she made toast and Vegemite. However, one night she wiped the butter knife on a towel. The evidence alerted the aunties to what she had been doing. When Anne found out, she hit Sarah with a shoe and threw her down a staircase. But the punishment only emboldened Sarah. She began taking long walks at night, further and further from up top. One night she came to the home of some yuppies who lived in the area. One of their windows was unlocked and she took the opportunity to enter their home and steal all the food she could grab. 
She stashed the plunder in a pile of leaves just off of Anne's property. At first, only she knew about the food, but eventually the other children found out, and she began leading them on midnight raids to steal more food. Sarah couldn't have known it then, but this act of disobedience would set in motion events that led to the downfall of the family. The local police started to visit up top more and more in the late 70s. Sarah's raids became so frequent that the police began to seriously investigate the break-ins and stolen food. Moreover, the surrounding community was beginning to catch on to the idea that something strange might be going on at Uptop. The cherry on top was that in 1980, 10-year-old Kim Holm went missing. Kim was kidnapped by the family, but this time someone took notice. Her father, Hans, last saw her when he dropped her off at her mother's house. He remembered a suspicious white Datsun parked in his ex-wife's driveway. When Kim didn't show up for school the next day, Hans went to the courts, asking for full custody of his daughter, though he didn't even know where she was. Luckily, he'd written down the Dotson's license plate, and the police were able to track it to Uptop. However, they didn't find Kim there. Still, the family was suddenly under a very negative spotlight. It was the first court case brought against them, and the judge decided to let the media into the courtroom. Though they couldn't be charged with kidnapping Kim because it was her mother who had done that, Their connection to the kidnapping was made very public. It was bad for Anne, but she didn't seem to care very much. A few years earlier, in 1978, Anne had married William Bill Byrne, adding Byrne to her surname. Bill was an ex-RAF Englishman who had moved to Australia to acquire fortune as an earth-moving contractor. He was rich and willing to do whatever Anne told him. Partly thanks to his money and the cumulative donations of other cult members throughout the years, Anne had amassed a large fortune. She owned numerous properties around the world, including ones in areas like New York, Hawaii, and England. The date of her supposed apocalypse was fast approaching, and with her wealth, she didn't feel the need to keep up the charade any longer. So do you think she was making it all up? Well, like we discussed earlier, she may have believed all of the mystical claptrap she was spouting to her followers in her younger years, but this later stage in her life suggests that she was no longer a believer. If she really believed the world was going to come to an end and that she was the Christ, she would have continued the charade. But what we see instead is the obvious humanity of a tired con artist who duped hundreds of people into giving her their money and property. The con had worked. She had nothing left to gain, nothing left to prove. This lackadaisical attitude towards her cult was reflected in her treatment of the Uptop children. She became disinterested in controlling them. In 1985, she allowed Sarah and Leanne, now 16 years of age, to make two friends outside the cult community. These were Kathy and Helen, teenage sisters who attended classes with Sarah and Leanne. Together, they ate McDonald's, had home-cooked meals, went to the mall, and generally did normal things that teenage girls do. Kathy and Helen did not hesitate to let Sarah and Leanne know that the lives they were living were extremely weird. The two girls began to refer to themselves as POAs, or Prisoners of Anne. One day, Sarah was having dinner with Kathy and Helen's mother, Erica. When they had finished, Erica gave Sarah a ride home, and Sarah arranged one final act of rebellion. She invited Erica into Uptop. Anne was in Hawaii at the time, but when she heard what happened, she threw Sarah out of the house and out of the family with this to say, quote, You are no longer our daughter. Go out there. Go and die in the gutter. End quote. Once she was thrown out of the house, Sarah went to live with Kathy and Helen. She was depressed that she'd left the rest of the children under Anne's control, but she didn't know what she could do about it. Kathy and Helen's parents knew what to do they took her to the police. In August of 1987, Uptop's door came crashing down in front of the force of a police battering ram. State and federal police raided the building at 7 a.m., scooping up the children. Anne was away at her home in the Catskill Mountains, but Bill was there. He held one of the children tight, refusing to give her up. A policeman stuck him with a revolver and said, let her go. He refused. Other officers wrestled the child from him. Police raids were also conducted on Anne's and other cultists' homes in the hills. Huge stashes of prescription drugs and LSD were seized. From the safety of her New York home, Anne released a quavering, weepy, recorded message to her followers. Anne said, quote, My dear friends, there is no church large enough to hold the splendor of the light and the glory of the Holy Spirit. 
There is no creed possible for the sublime, wondrous understanding when you touch God. Only love can understand love, and only the godlike can attain to this God consciousness filling all the spaces, whereas there is no space. Children, we are all children. Many dear old Christians have fallen flat on it, you know. We are here to give, remember that, to love. It is as simple as that, living that others may feel your love. End quote. So the cult was over. With their guru stuck in America, what happened to Anne's followers? With their leader gone, the cult began to disperse. The cat was really out of the bag, and many of the members feared legal action should they remain connected with the organization. Remember, they were upper middle class. They knew how to protect themselves legally. Despite this, not all of them escaped completely unscathed. Howard Whitaker's practice was disgraced, his license stripped for his continued use of psychedelic drugs. Similarly, Dr. Rainer Johnson's reputation took a deadly blow. He had defended the family very publicly on television and in print. After the cult was exposed to the public, his contributions to physics no longer mattered. He was blacklisted. The aunties lived out their lives in freedom, but all have since died. They will never be brought to justice. What about Anne? Was she ever extradited? Did the children get justice? I'm afraid they didn't. The family still exists today though its numbers have dwindled to a mere handful. The Australian government did coordinate with the FBI to get Anne sent back to Australia for trial on August 17, 1993. However, the courts didn't have any evidence to charge the cult with. It was decided that the children had been traumatized enough and that to use them in the trial would be an unfair strain, ultimately not worth it. Without the children's testimony, the only charges the Victorian Magistrates Court could bring them up on were conspiracy to defraud and commit perjury for false registration of triplets. When sentencing was done in 1994, Anne and Bill walked away from the courthouse free people. The only repercussion they got for all the pain and misery they caused was a $5,000 fine each. It seems a gross miscarriage of justice given the lasting effects her abuse had on the Uptop children. In adulthood, the immense physical and emotional stress that Dr. Sarah Moore suffered during her youth caught up with her. She was consistently depressed, with diagnoses of PTSD and bipolar disorder as well. By 2004, she had begun forging prescriptions to feed her addiction to an opiate called pethidine. She attempted suicide various times. One attempt in 2008 necessitated the amputation of her leg after she accidentally injected air into it. The strain of these physical and mental ails proved too much for Sarah, the first child Anne stole, the bravest of them all, who rescued her brothers and sisters from their prison, died tragically in May of 2016 at the young age of 46. Meanwhile, Anne Hamilton Byrne still lives free and rich under the palliative care in a suburban nursing home. She's 96 with an estimated net worth of $10 million. A shroud of dementia protects her from the law's scrutiny, even as it jellies her mind. When asked why she did what she did in a recent interview, Anne's face, worn by age and twisted by countless surgeries, stretched into a sinister smile. Her crazy eyes glinted like Lake Eildon as she replied, I love children. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify. Or on our website, parcast.com. Spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Monday as we delve into the twisted psychology behind the cult known as the Ant Hill Kids. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, production assistance by Carrie Murphy, Joel Stein, Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by John Gray and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. 
every haunted place on earth has a terrifying real backstory. In my new podcast, I take you on audio tours of these real places and tell the legends that made them paranormal minefields. Listen and subscribe to Parcast's newest podcast, Haunted Places, hosted by yours truly, on your favorite podcast directory this Halloween season. Have a haunted Halloween.